welcome everyone to this second talk in our series on gender economics. I'm Johanna Rikne. The co-host here are Olle Folke and Petra Burisova from the CEPR. And uh, today we're very delighted to present Sonia Balotra as our speaker. She is a professor of economics at the University of Essex. And she's a super productive researcher working on very important issues like uh, child labor, child health, maternal health, uh, female labor force participation and wages. She's worked on dowries and also, of course, on domestic violence, like we're going to hear about today. And one of the first really great papers that I personally came across, um, she in that paper, she shows that having women politicians in office encourages more women to be become politicians in the future. And uh, Sonia's work uh, often looks at developing countries and has a very strong policy relevance and policy evaluation perspective. So I really encourage you all to go to her webpage, follow her on Twitter, find out more about her work. Um, before giving the floor to Sonia, I want to talk a little bit about the format for today's talk. We have 40 minutes of presentation and 20 minutes of, for the Q&A. And for the presentation, um, please limit, like you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A at any time, but Ulle uh, or one of the co-authors on this paper would, will answer the clarifying questions throughout the talk or might uh, interrupt Sonia too. And then for the Q&A at the end, um, you can write your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function. And then we are going to make you a co-panelist so that you can uh, ask your question in person. So don't hesitate to use the Q&A function for anything that you're wondering about. Uh, OK, and with that, I would like to give the word to Sonia. Thank you, Johanna. That was a very kind introduction. Um, today I'm presenting joint work with Diogo Brito, Paolo Pinotti, and Breno Sampeo. And I think Diogo and Breno are online and might be able to help with clarifying questions. And then we'll all talk at the Q&A. So this is um, a paper about domestic violence, which is possibly um, more widespread than most of us have ever imagined. It's one of the most widespread violations of human rights. In the US, it's estimated to cost six billion in medical care and productivity shortfalls and is a fundamental cause of and manifestation of gender inequality. <clears throat> Yet, it has drawn significantly less intellectual curiosity from economists than aspects of gender inequality, such as the pay gap. In this paper, we look at how economic shocks and economic policies influence domestic violence. We use large administrative data from Brazil, and we ask three distinct questions. How does male job displacement influence perpetration of violence? How does female job displacement influence the risk of victimization? And for this work, identification will use individuals displaced in mass layoffs. In a departure, we think from most of the domestic violence literature, we'll investigate endogenous reporting. Um, we also ask a third question, which we believe hasn't been addressed in this literature, which is whether unemployment insurance mitigates impacts of job loss and domestic violence. For this exercise, we're able to leverage a discontinuity in eligibility for benefits. We're going to argue that the confluence of these three parameters estimated in the same setting, puts us in a strong position to illuminate the underlying mechanisms. So what are the mechanisms we think are at play? We have a simple conceptual framework in which we describe job loss as constituting a significant negative shock to income and possibly identity and a positive shock to time. So the income shock triggers renegotiation over this shrunken household budget. And just that can open the door for conflict. But this could be aggravated by the uncertainty created by income uncertainty created by layoff, uh, by generalized psychological stress and possible substance abuse, 
And this could interact with, it need not be, it not, need not work through income alone. It could be that um, one's identity suffers and that creates stress of its own. And then there's a time shock, which here means that if either partner is unemployed, then the time the partners spend together is on average going to increase. So the opportunities for crime increase. And this is um, the inverse of incapacitation in the crime literature. What's important here is that all of these three mechanisms, the income shock, the identity shock, and the time shock, predict an increase in domestic violence following job loss of either partner. Now, if you think about unemployment benefits in this framework, they undo or partly undo the positive shock to income. Uh, sorry, they partly do the undo the negative shock to income as they constitute a positive shock, and they potentially reinforce the time shock. And that's because unemployment benefits tend to increase unemployment duration. So in putting together the income and time effects of UI, um, the impacts of UI in mitigating um, the, the impacts of job loss and violence are ambiguous. Yeah. So, did I? Yeah. So, our main results are that both male and female job loss independently increase domestic violence, and that UI to men doesn't mitigate. We have very imprecise results for UI to women. They will be in the paper, but we don't discuss them here just because they're imprecise. So these results are consistent with the framework we just laid out and suggest income and exposure as mechanisms with identity possibly being in the mix. So a quick word here on existing models of domestic violence in the literature but I will talk more about them and how we reconcile our evidence with them at the end of the talk. So the interesting thing that I want to flag here is that existing models predict opposite signed effects of male and female unemployment on domestic violence. The workhorse model in the economics literature is the bargaining model, and it predicts that um, Domestic violence emerges as a function of the relative income of the couple. So as male unemployment increases, this leads to lower domestic violence because his power is muted as his outside options weaken. And the converse for her, if she's unemployed, um, she's in a weaker position. And so she's more subject to domestic violence. There is a model called the male backlash model, which many economists have found evidence consistent with, uh, especially in patriarchal societies, which has the exact opposite prediction. And the idea here is that in societies where there's a strong male breadwinner norm, um, an improvement in women's employment opportunities can trigger domestic violence because it primes male identity and threatens the position of the man. I'm trying to be brief here because we have a lot to discuss, but, um, and, and I will talk more about other models at the end, but there's another model which has been brought to the literature and economics, which is instrumental control. And the idea is that men commit violence to extract resources from women. So the paper I cite here looks at uh, uh, cash transfer in the US and shows that when um, the timing of the cash transfer is changed uh, such that um, um, it's available more frequently, domestic violence goes up uh, because the transfer represents an opportunity for men to extract resources. The upshot for us is that existing papers or existing models predict uh, opposite signed effects. And I just want to leave you with the thought that these existing studies have all used the area level unemployment rate or the area level relative wage of men and women. So they're analyzing marginal changes in relative income or in the case of unemployment and the probability of becoming unemployed. In contrast, 
individual job loss is a large and realized shock. So we're going to argue later that existing models like bargaining play a potential role, but a second order role in determining the relative magnitude of the impacts of male and female job loss, rather than the first order impacts which are driven by income and exposure. So our contributions, we believe this is the first evidence of impacts of individual job loss. This links to a larger literature in labor economics that shows impacts of individual job loss on mortality, fertility, mental health, and other large life outcomes. Um, the fact that we analyze, uh, analyze job loss of both men and women is informative of mechanisms. And uh, these are the first results for unemployment insurance. So um, to summarize, the DV literature has focused, if you look at the number of papers on any one thing, on the financial empowerment of women, giving them cash transfers, microcredit, skills, or actual jobs. And we introduce an additional focus on economic shocks at the individual level to men. Also, the literature has focused on relative income or the power equation, and we shift the focus to look at liquidity constraints or absolute income shocks, as well as time shocks. Okay, so I start now with um, the usual layout, data, strategy, results. Um, the data are two, primarily from two registers, the criminal justice register and the employer-employee register for Brazil. Both run from 2009 to 18. Domestic violence cases in the court records are 2 million, which are 11% of all criminal justice cases in Brazil in this period. We define domestic violence as facing, a facing or filing a prosecution or a protective measure. Um, so in the criminal records, we can identify the defendant, the man, and the plaintiff, the woman, by name. And then we find them in the employer-employee register. So we have their career trajectory, which will in some cases include being displaced. We retain the sample of full-time workers of prime age, 48% of which are women. Uh, the data set is very large with about 100 million workers and 10, 10 million layoffs each year. We bring into the analysis two additional data sets, a household survey that allows us to estimate the extent to which informal work, which is quite um, important in Brazil, buffers the impact of mass layoff in the formal sector. I, I probably didn't say. The employment registers that we're using as our main source of um, data uh, are for formal sector workers only. And then we, also bring in the social welfare register, which is an administrative database um, of about half of the Brazilian population, selectively low income, where we can identify couples so that we can confirm that the results hold in a couple's file. The linkage between these data sets relies on name and details are in the paper, but we remove non-unique names. And it's important to say up front that because the woman's name is often missing for reasons of confidentiality, um, we'll have a smaller sample for the female job loss analysis, which will restrict some of the additional work that we do on that side of the story. This is just a simple descriptive to start us off. You see in the data that across the distribution of age, the chances that a man faces a court order for domestic violence are substantially higher, marked by the red curve, if um, he's been displaced than if he hasn't, which is the black curve. The empirical strategy involves estimating an event study um, in differences, why the outcome is the probability of perpetration in the case of male job loss or victimization in the case of female job loss. 
the indicator treated identifies workers displaced in a mass layoff in year T. We look only at layoffs in the middle of our sample period so that we have pre and post data um, to track them before and after layoff. Because we have such a large data set, we're able to do the matching quite precisely. A matched control is a worker who wasn't displaced in year T. And we do play with that definition to assess robustness. Um, and uh, the match is done on gender, state, cohort, tenure, income, industry, and firm size. Um, the main concern with this strategy is the dynamic selection into treatment. The event study graphs will display free trends, which you'll see are not differential. So that mitigates this concern. We repeat the event study using more time dis disaggregated data, which provides a finer check. We also vary the definition of mass layoffs. The baseline definition is 33%, which is common in the literature. And we take it up to 7590 and to the limiting case of plant closures. We also implement another check, which involves um, comparing treated and untreated firms where a firm is treated if it has a mass layoff. So this is like an ITT where we remove the worker level potential selection. Our, our estimates, our estimator is, um, takes account of recent critiques in the literature. It allows for heterogeneous effects, effects that vary by unit or time, sorry, by group or time, and uh, negative weights are not an issue. The third um, possible concern with our um, inference is that there are missing criminal records. These vary largely by jurisdiction. In other words, in some areas of Brazil, um, confidentiality is a greater concern than in other areas. So we, as we can't actually deal with it. It's possibly non-random, but what we can do is assess sensitivity of our estimates to changing the restriction, for example, the baseline restriction of having a jurisdiction in our sample only if at least 10% of names are available, but we vary that right up to 90. Also, we discuss endogenous reporting, which I'll elaborate later. So I had a clarifying question that yeah. came up here, and yeah. that is the identification. So that's solely based on names of the individuals, or is there some ident additional identifier? No, we, we, we use just names because in the court data, that's all we have. In the employment register, there is the social security number, but it's not in the court register. So we remove non-unique names and we, because we have the formal sector register and then basically all informal sector workers, I think all are uh, captured in the social welfare register. If we stack those two registers, we have something like 95% of Brazil's population. And we use that as a, as a data bank on which to analyze how often there are repeat names. And we take the, what we're showing you takes the, uh, implements the harshest restriction, which is dropping all duplicates. And then we do a robustness check where we drop only if you're a duplicate within your state. And we're encouraged by the fact that it doesn't seem to make much difference. Okay. Should I carry on? Yes, please. Yeah. So I'm going to present the results in three parts and I'm going to try and speed up now because there's a lot of stuff. It's like three different investigations. Um, these are the results for the impacts of job loss on labor income, which is like a first stage. We have a similar plot for employment, very similar. We see on average over the post layoff period, a 21% drop in employment because there's some recovery, a 40% drop in labor income. And you see in the right hand panel, a jump in domestic violence after layoff, which is persistent through the four years and represents relative to the baseline, an increase of 32%. 
Now it could be that we overstate the first stage because we ignore that if you're laid off from the formal sector, you might seek work in the informal sector. But using an outside data set, we estimate that uh, the drop in income would only be adjusted from 41 down to 36%, based on which we think it's not a first order concern. This uh, plot just is the same as before, but with quarterly data, so you can have a closer look at the dynamics after and the trends, uh, the possibility of differential trends before. So um, we now talk a little bit about reporting because this result, which looks to us fairly large and is robust to lots of checks I'm not showing you that I talked about, um, I simply don't have time there in the paper, but we, the, the results are robust to varying the definition of mass layoff, doing that by minimum firm size restrictions, uh, to varying the sample restrictions and so on. Um, but the first order concern is that this entire result could be driven by reporting. So when the man has lost his job, if he becomes less attractive to the woman to retain in the partnership, she may be more likely to report. So you could see an increase in domestic violence driven entirely by her reporting more when he's unemployed. Our, our, best, um, our best take on this is that the data identify in flagrante cases, which is cases caught in action. They could be caught by the police and often will involve third party reporting, thereby eliminating the question of whether the woman chooses to report and undermining any endogenous reporting bias. We also look at, um, we break down domestic violence by severity, thinking that the most severe crimes are more likely to be reported. So in the extreme, femicide is always reported. It's a, it's a murder. But low intensity cases may be subject to bias. So if reporting was quite important in driving these estimates, we should see a higher responsiveness of coefficients for low intensity domestic violence. And for speed, I won't read this out, but similarly, we may expect differences by measures of how stable the partnership is. And then we can look at a completely different measure in this social register, which is the selectively low income half of the population um, to validate the results for the court measures. And we don't have this yet, but we are putting together hospitalization measures as well. So this is a picture of the results for the domestic violence cases that were caught in action. And you see a similar pattern and actually the, the margin, the sort of relative effect relative to the baseline is larger. Here you look, you see on the left, a breakdown of all cases into cases um, where the maximum penalty is four years or more versus less. Uh, and this is a measure of how severe the crime is. On the right panel is a different measure of severity. And the qu quick um, takeaway is that we see this impact on domestic violence of all types. We also see um, uh, an increase in the use of public shelters following male job loss and the percentage increase at 24% is in the same ballpark as for the uh, prosecution and protective measures in the court data. So a quick summary, male job loss leads to a sharp, sharp upon layoff and persistent increase in DV of 32%. If you break this down into protective and prosecution, uh, two sorts of charges, it's 30 and 40% roughly. You might wonder about the persistence because there is uh, some recovery of income and employment, but it's not complete. So all we can add to that is that uh, Brazil has very high turnover. And after you lose a formal sector job, there's a lot of uncertainty and the next job you get is likely to be quite low tenure. We see that in the data. It could also be that once you commit domestic violence, you fall into a pattern 
And indeed, this is a stylized fact. A woman who's once been abused has about a 50% chance of being abused again by the same person. Um, and our results appear to us not driven by selection and not driven by reporting. We do more checks in the paper and we can talk more about the validity of the results at the end. So if I move on now to female job loss, we do, uh, we take a very similar approach. We find a similar looking first stage with a 31% drop in earnings and in relative terms, a higher percentage increase in the risk of domestic violence of 62%. For data reasons, we're only looking now at protective measures filed by the woman who loses her job and not at prosecution. These results are robust. We don't show you to test for selection and to the test for how important the missing data are. A few words on the relative magnitude of the female and male job loss coefficients. So if you compare like with like and look only at protective measures, um, female job loss has a much larger effect, almost twice as large. If you look at public shelter use, which we haven't shown you for female job loss, again, the coefficient's larger for women. But if we use the same uh, protective measures sample for the court outcomes, um, the coefficients are actually equal. So this difference is driven possibly by compositional differences in the sample. So if we take this as the result that the coefficients are equal, we still think that actually the female coefficient is possibly larger for two, two reasons. Um, we spelt out earlier that endogenous reporting or reporting that's a function of the unemployment event will tend to lead to overestimation of the male coefficient, if at all it matters, uh, but underestimation of the female coefficient. So I'll say that again, if the woman is unemployed herself, she'll be less likely to report because her outside options are weaker and she's, she's going to be more tolerant of domestic violence. If that speculation is right, then we underestimate the coefficient for women's job loss. And then there's a second reason, which is that the, what we're studying is a binary event of job loss. But in fact, where men contribute a larger share of household income, the job loss of men will be a bigger shock to household income than the job loss of women. And so if we were to rescale, we would see a bigger effect of female job loss per unit um, income. <coughs> so this, this uh, um, the, the relative sizes we argue are consistent with a bargaining model coming in uh, to the picture or bargaining sort of um, um, behavior coming into the picture as a second order thing following the baseline tendency for job loss to create an income shock, which creates violence. So um, we looked at, uh, we looked to match couples to see if the results carry through. We use the social register. So these couples are selectively lower income. If you look at the first column here, the main result that's important is that we see positive coefficients for male and female job loss once more. It's interesting to notice that for both male and female job loss, the risk of violence increases more when they have a young child. It's also relevant that in the case of male job loss, but not the second panel, the risk of violence is greater when she's not employed. And I think some of this can come back in discussion time. I'll just say quickly that we think that these patterns with regard to young children and his job loss when she's not employed uh, can be rationalized 
with reference to income exposure bargaining. And we can talk through this more at the end. We also see now that the effect size has swapped, so it's larger for male job loss. And we think this is consistent with this being a low income sample, but we don't discuss it or emphasize it a lot because standard errors are actually large and those coefficients are noticeably different, but um, statistically the difference isn't as big as the magnitude difference. Now on mechanisms, we started with the setup of job loss constituting a negative income shock and a positive time shock. And we've been chasing that, uh, that story. Um, we do two things now in this section to try and identify the relevance of the income shock, the negative income shock. And for data reasons, we discuss here only the male um, job loss results. Um, we do two things. First, we invest, investigate heterogeneity in the treatment effect by worker characteristics. We'll show all, but we're going to home in on tenure because it's a proxy for liquidity constraints at the time of job displacement. This is because severance pay and unemployment benefits are both systematically increasing in tenure at displacement. Um, we recognize that tenure is correlated with other characteristics of the worker, including age, education, income. So we control for the gradients in these um, and uh, but recognizing that this is still not an experiment, we also look at experimental variation in access to unemployment benefits. The heterogeneity and treatment effects. I think the striking thing here, these are graphs for age, sorry about this, income and education. The striking thing is that domestic violence is pervasive. It's not the preserve of poor men or young men. Um, it's also relevant to note that the dotted um, lines, which are the confidence intervals around a coefficient with the conditioning on the other gradients are not very different. So when we condition on observables like the education gradient, the tenure gradient doesn't move much. And this tells us that unobservables are unlikely to play a large role. Thinking of the Alton G table, Tabor sort of argument where the play of unobservables will scale with the play of observables. So we think these results tell us that, oh, sorry, I haven't got there. Sorry, this result um, tells us, uh, sorry, I thought I was looking at this slide. So there we see that across every characteristic group, there is domestic violence. But for tenure, we see a clear gradient. And in particular, for men with at least three years at the time of displacement, there is no domestic violence. This is cleaner on this picture. Uh, but it has to be said that the men with three or more years of tenure at displacement are only about 10% of the sample in Brazil. Brazil is marked by high, high turnover. <coughs> Still, what we take away from this exercise is that liquidity at displacement matters or liquidity constraints are a mechanism um, triggering domestic violence. We look at the same question again with the unemployment benefit experiment. Unemployment benefits in Brazil are quite generous and on average are 80% of former earnings. They vary with tenure through three to five months. Here we have a sample of selectively low tenure workers um, because we're using a eligibility discontinuity, which is essentially that if a worker wants to claim benefits today, he needs to have been, um, he needs to have left at least 16 months since he last claimed. And so we have eligibility um, shift uh, changing sharply at, the, at that uh, boundary of 16 months since the last job, sorry, since the last claim. Um, as with any RD design, we need to look at um, whether there's manipulation around the threshold and at the balance of predetermined covariates. 
So here on the left is the density of the running variable, which is um, the, the weeks since the cutoff, I mean, the time you've been unemployed since the last claim, relative to 16, which is this line. And uh, these are various predetermined covariates referring to the worker or his sector or his firm, which shows smoothness at the threshold. So our first result is to confirm, as the labor economics literature has shown before, that eligibility for unemployment benefits increases the duration of unemployment. Here, the, gap, the additional weeks unemployed is about seven. This can increase domestic violence because it increases exposure or opportunities for crime. But it doesn't have to be that. It could also be behaviors that you fall into when you're idle, such as substance abuse. Um, this, these are the results for DV. They're clearer in a table. I'll show you the graphs in a minute. So semester one is when you're receiving cash. And there's absolutely no difference between eligible and ineligible workers. So, so basically, benefits make no difference while they're being received. However, by the time they cease to be offered, that they expire, in year two, you see a gap between eligible and ineligible workers opens up, and it's perverse. So eligible workers commit more domestic violence. This result is robust to a number of checks, including using the the, the bandwidth suggested by um, CCT, Catalano, I think the word is, and others, uh, to polynomial choices for um, the running variable and to permutation tests. We show one placebo here. Um, and this is, uh, these are the equivalent graphs. Um, basically, a gap opens up in year two and is larger in year three. A summary of what we've just seen is that eligibility has no impact on domestic violence while the benefits are being paid, but it increases after. And we rationalize this by arguing that there are um, domestic violence reducing income effects while the cash is flowing, but after that, the time effects dominate. You might wonder whether workers don't smooth the benefits they receive over time. Uh, but there's evidence from Brazil in the paper by Gerard and Aritomi that they don't. And in fact, this is a wider result, also shown in other papers for richer countries. So these results are consistent with income and exposure, um, but with them conflicting um, in the period after layoff. Now we saw um, in the results for tenure that there was um, a cutoff at which domestic violence basically um, didn't happen, which was the high tenure workers. But that sample had much more variation in liquidity. So there was more income, more liquidity at displacement, bigger gaps between the first and the third group I showed you, and so bigger income effects. And there was severance pay added to unemployment benefits, all, all mapping into tenure, or the other way around, tenure mapping into these benefits. So, uh, but, and severance pay has weaker impacts on unemployment duration, essentially because you don't lose severance pay if you get a job, but you do lose benefits if you get a job. So our conclusions, um, Male and female job loss each trigger large, persistent, and pervasive, as in across the distribution of more, most worker types, increases in domestic violence. These results are consistent with our framework of job loss causing a loss in income and an increase in time at home. The relative magnitudes of the coefficients for male and female job loss we think are um, informative of how important the bargaining model is versus the backlash or instrumental control models which give opposite predictions. Unemployment benefits are not effective in our sample mostly. 
but they will, but we do find evidence consistent with income effects. So we expect that they will dominate if the incentive effects that lead to higher durations of unemployment could be minimized by policies that get men back into work. There is a literature on job training programs and whether or not they're cost effective. So it's relevant to add that if in evaluating the effectiveness of these programs, we took account of their benefits in terms of lower domestic violence and the costs associated with not controlling domestic violence, they would look more cost effective. These results are also potentially relevant to COVID, which we describe in recent blogs. And that's because um, COVID is about job loss and exposure about being locked down <coughs> together at home. As I have, I think about three or four minutes, I want to say a few more words about, um, or maybe this is clear. Yeah, maybe I'll leave this up and stop so you can ask questions because I moved actually more quickly than I thought I could. Okay. Okay, so thanks for a great talk. Um, uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand in the participant list, write in the Q&A or write in the chat. Either works fine. So I first give the word to Shochana, uh, ask a question. I've promoted you to panelist, so you can ask it. Okay, let me, thank you very much. Uh, this, this was a great uh, presentation and an amazing piece of research. Um, the, the one thing that strikes me um, is that there is no uh, reference to marriage market conditions. And uh, in Brazil, you have enormous uh, racial stratification and marriage markets are very likely to uh, to be different depending on one's race and also regional part, you know, factors. It might be very different in the Nordest from, from Rio, Sao Paulo. And so um, I, I think that should be taken into account. I wonder if it is. Thank you. It's very relevant, of course, because we do talk about outside options and we proxy them with um, labor market conditions. Um, clearly, marriage markets also matter for your outside option. The main reason we don't discuss them is that we don't have a measure of marriage market conditions. The way we could address that is to do is to introduce regional variation. Right now, we're pooling everything. If we introduced regional variation, <coughs> we would, although we have these amazingly big data sets, I don't think I honed in on the observations because I didn't show you the tables, but the results for men are using 11 million. I might, if I'm wrong, my co-authors will correct me, but I think we have 11 million men and about 1 million women. So you would think we, we are rather spoiled and could drill down to regions, but in fact, domestic violence as brought to the court is a fairly rare event. And so I don't think we have statistical power to do stuff by region. But you're right, and in the writing of the paper, we acknowledge that there are so many other things that we don't shift. We just look at job loss, and so we, we, we talk about it. Thank you. So there has been quite a few questions answered in Q&A by your co-authors. Uh, but I thought I would read out one of them so that you can um, answer it publicly as well. And please, those of you in attendance, uh, raise your hand or ask in some other way if you want to ask a public question. So this is from Geraint Jones, and I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. So interesting shift effects, but how do they vary with household income? Is it a loss of job per se, or is it added pressure of poverty that causes the rise in incidence of domestic violence? And how does it differ between situations where one partner becomes unemployed versus one where both are unemployed is an effect whereby spending more time together raises incidence of domestic violence. I did go very quickly over the couple's data and we've made some choices for time to not show everything. But here we're looking at, I think, the second part of the question, which is 
how male job loss or, and female job loss, one in each panel, varies with whether the other partner is employed or not. And you can see that for male job loss, the impacts are greater if she's not employed. But for female job loss, it doesn't seem to make any difference at all. And we rationalize this by saying that um, it's consistent with, let me just go back there actually, it's consistent with an income shock because if, um, uh, if she's not employed and he loses his job, it's a bigger shock to the household. They could be down to no income. So it's just a bigger shock. It's consistent with exposure because she's already unemployed and at home, and now he gets unemployed. So exposure increases. It's also consistent with bargaining. She's unemployed and, uh, and so she's, um, she's more um, tolerant of domestic violence. So we see that the pattern here in these last two coefficients as consistent with our general story on mechanisms. Why there isn't a difference here? Uh, I can't clearly say why, because we, we don't have a clear test, but it seems plausible based on these being lower income women who typically contribute less to the total income than the man. It, there may also be a role for male, no <coughs> sorry, male norms <coughs> being stronger in this sample than in the full sample, which includes formal sector workers. I think there was a part one to this question. Could you say it again? Did I, I, I missed the first part of the question. Does do the effects vary with household income as well? Oh yeah, we actually have it. We had a table where the next two columns were income. And from memory, my co-authors will tell me if I'm wrong. Um, my memory is that for male job loss, it did not vary by baseline income. For female job loss, it did and was bigger when the family was poorer. Mm -hmm. Also, just say quickly, it's a different question because that's not household income. Mm -hmm. But we did show earlier this fairly striking result that um, the increase in domestic violence following job loss is um, similar across income groups where you use <coughs> the baseline income of the man as the uh, to cut the data. Perfect. So then we have a question from uh, Miriam Wust. The question is, given that tenure in a given job appears to be short on average, how do you handle these frequent events, job losses in the event graphs? Do you only use the first job loss of a man, for example? So basically, the way we set it up, we use the job loss that occurs in a mass layoff in the formal sector in those years 2012 to 14. Uh, we don't restrict it to being the first, but um, we have, so he was employed before mm -hmm. and then he gets displaced. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I think I am. So this is how we define treatment. So in that short space of time, uh, maybe yeah. you're asking what you do if he's laid off twice. Um, I think that was the question as well. Okay. So if he's laid off twice, we're actually not doing anything. We think those cases are few. So we're not, we're just in the data. Those, those men will contribute to the, um, uh, to the drop in income, the first stage being bigger. And it's actually a good question. I believe we don't even look at whether they're laid off twice and we could. And so we could repeat this analysis restricting to the first layoff. And Breno Diogo, if you want to add something here on, on if, if what I said is right, that way, if there are two layoffs, we're not removing the men, we're just. Uh, yeah, this is correct. So I actually had a question as well. I think this is very interesting. Uh, do you have any sense on, like, given that bribes are common in Brazil, if the police are less likely to accept the bribes or if there could be anything like that, that things do not end up on the books if people have a job? Um, so I'll tell you what I can say, which is that 
Brazil has taken fairly extraordinary efforts, it was a pioneer with women only police stations. Um, it's also got, uh, I think, better shelters by head of population than many other countries. <clears throat> so Brazil has really made an effort to encourage reporting, partly by putting in women only stations and having women front end a lot of the process. So we think that, so I'd say it's not as likely as otherwise that there is bribing, but it's true that though we look at court data, you reach court via the people via making a police, uh, registering a police case. I don't know if Breno and Diogo know more about Brazil that's relevant to this question. Yeah, uh, so my perception is that this is something more likely, you know, if you're arrested with drugs, uh, by the police and then, you know, someone might bribe the police for them to let it pass. But here in the case, if a woman wants to report, you know, she shows up at one police station, she does the report and even if her husband knows someone at the police station, she just can just move to the next one. So, I mean, she can go to any police station to go through this type of procedure. And yeah, I, I think in this context, I think it's it's fairly unlikely that uh, it would be a, a big part of the story. Like in... I have one more question here. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this amazing presentation. So I do have a question, and is there is also many evidence that once a violent event happens, divorce also could arise as as an answer to, to the violence. So. Is there anything that you can say about uh, once you have this unemployment spells and there is violence, if, for example, the female is employed, uh, what happens with the divorce rate, if it depends on employment or, uh, yeah. Have yeah. you spoken any of those stories? So, uh, I have thought about this and with the data we have, we cannot look at divorce. It's not in the data, but I've thought, my thinking is that if, if, uh, and I think it's, plausible. If mass layoff is um, followed by divorce, um, we probably underestimate impacts in the sense, I mean, they're the real impacts, but um, if divorce were somehow not allowed, we'd see bigger effects because she's simply not there. So the potential, I mean, divorce is like an extreme case of no exposure. So if she divorces, <clears throat> the, the exposure that we talk about again and again is shut down. There's no exposure, so he can't commit violence. So potential violence would be larger following layoff if divorce were taken into account. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from uh, Shoshana. I would like to know um, whether there is a role played by whether a couple is married or not, because in Brazil, consensual unions are very common. Yeah, so um, it, we haven't looked at this, and in the main analysis, we cannot because we don't have that information. In the social register data where we identify couples, what we do know is that they're living together, that's how we identify them. Um, whether they're married or not, do we know, Diogo, if they're living together? Do we know if they're married or just living together? I'm not sure. Uh, no, we don't have this information. Uh, perhaps one thing to say about that is that the effects, they seem quite widespread in terms of, you know, for all income brackets, for all education levels and age and so on. So it doesn't seem something driven by, you know, one particular group or people um, yeah, although we cannot direct check that, the, the, the effect seems quite pervasive. Yeah. And the other thing I'd say to that is just that um, something I didn't really know was, uh, I mean, I expected smaller magnitudes is when in our main analysis, not the couple's data, the main analysis, it's only about half of all domestic violence cases that are with your cohabiting partner. The others are with your ex-partner or a child or could be a sister um, and this is why actually moving to the couple's data is useful because there we are talking about the couple and do you find that the fact they live together is reducing or 
affecting the rate of domestic violence? We can't say with our data. We, we, don't, have, we don't have information on couples who are not cohabiting. I think you're asking how the coefficients compare between the couples data set and the first results. And we can't compare because the couples data set is, is from the social register. So they're just the lower, 50, the lower income 50% of the population. So we can't compare like with like. We have couples from the lower half of the income distribution. And for the full distribution, we have individuals who are named in court records as a victim or a thin, sorry, a victim or a perpetrator. <clears throat> but we don't, um, we don't know who the other side of the equation is. Okay, so thanks for a fantastic talk to Sonia. Uh, this was great. And we want to welcome all of you back in two weeks uh, when we have Joe Altonje, who will present a paper on marriage dynamics, earnings dynamics, and lifetime family income. So that's on the 19th. So we hope to see you then. And once again, thanks for a great talk. Thank you to everyone. joining us.